So if we have any uh, questions or comments, yes, sir? Sure. Uh, I have to go to the microphone. Yeah, yes, you have to go to the microphone because we're being recorded by every form of technology. <laughs> Hello, I, di I didn't have a question until that last question of yours, Mr. Prevere. First of all, thank you for coming, Mr. Carey. Thank you for calling your question. I appreciate that. <laughs> you truly are my literary hero. Thank you for coming. Um, regarding the Kelly Gang, I think out of all of your books, that is the only one that is unadaptable because it is not the story, it is the writing that makes that book. It is a superb book and I think it would break my heart to see that adapted. <laughs> I really, really do and I'm not in a rush to see it. However, I do, wanna, I do wanna ask you something about Oscar and Lucinda, the film, which I thought was extremely well cast. I thought it was extremely well adapted until I got to the last scene and I'm dying to know what you thought of the end of Oscar Lucinda, the film. Spoiler Honestly. alert. <laughs> I just want to know what you felt about it. Like, we're not giving anything away. Well, uh, the, uh, mind you, the numbers I'm going to give you are old-fashioned. Are old but it was said at the time that the, that the film was made that you cannot make a film with a down ending for, with a budget in excess of $18 million. <laughs> so... Uh, and, the, and the filmmakers who were very courageous and very determined with the producer who ran with this thing for a long, long time. I really thought she was going to die before the film was made. I was worried. <laughs> Selfishly. Um, but she kept going. So these are all good people trying to make this film about something that they care about and that they get to this point where the, the, the ending is unacceptable to the money people. And they said, we've got this idea for another ending, and ending it like this. And I thought, well, why not? I mean, it, it's, it's not my book. It's a film. Uh, the book continues to exist. Yes, yeah. And uh, the film is a conversation with the book at its best. And in that case, the case of that film, I think it really, really is. And it's an authentic and conversation with the book. So that doesn't upset me at all. My book's written. Right. And, uh, and, and the thing that I, I said to Gillian Armstrong, the director, so, you know, it's like I've made a pot. You know, feel free to break it. In fact, you have to break it and you have to grind it up in the clay again and make, it, make a new pot. And I also said, you know, when I wrote the book, I gave myself the right to fail and I give it to you. And she said, and the right to succeed too. And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank okay. you. So the price of, of an unhappy ending is no more than $18 million. Well, oh, it's all changed. I mean, yeah. it's, it's right. much more expensive. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe you can have an unha unhappy ending for $30 million now. I don't Maybe, know. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yes, sir. Back to the duck. Um, it, it does eat and shit, but the main purpose, as I remember it, is to show that it digests. And, and so, you know, shows the mechanical process of, of our guts. But um, what... Which it doesn't do. It, well... It's a fake. Curiously enough, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because only we truly produce shit, as, yeah. as opposed to machines that only produce ground-up um, Good. Grain. But yes. um, what, what, um, what interested me about the fact that it, the duck appears in your book is purely serendipity because somebody said, oh, you're a Pynchon fan and it, it appears in Pynchon's V. No, it appears, well, it does, it appears. Somebody pointed out to me the other day the reading that, and, and showed me that, that, it, that it's in Mason Dixon. Right. Oh, that's right. That's uh, Mason Dixon. Because right. I would have, I, I hadn't actually read all of Mason Dixon. So it's I, like Nabokov hadn't read Kafka, right? Oh, yeah, right. No. So but, anyway, that was a surprise to me. No. So how much, how much do serendipities like that encourage you and how much do they impede you? Because, for instance, you mentioned that you're very glad in some ways that the oil industry helped you because May, uh, Matthew died on the day of the oil spill. But as you're writing, when you see things happening, because you know, all, all writers are in some ways prophets. They, they or look thieves. You. Pardon? Thieves. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Same thing. Um, how, how, much, how much do you hesitate when you see something like that happening, and how much are you encouraged? Uh, 
Well, I don't know. Nothing like that's ever happened to me in the sense of something in the world outside being incorporated into a novel. I've never ever done, done that before. And it wouldn't have occurred to me to do it, but suddenly there it was. And there I was watching the damn webcam of the oil spilling into the Gulf and feeling sick and frightened. And I ended up incorporating it. Uh, it wasn't my first thought at all. Uh, so I don't think that sort of thing happens. On the other hand, uh, I think we are thieves or we're blotting paper. Everything that is happening, and we're self-obsessed, everything that is happening all the time, one is, you know, this, this jug is here now, tonight, and tomorrow it could be fulfilling a totally different function in the, the, the chapter of a novel, and the water would have become gin, and different things would have happened, but I would take things from life that sort of the stuff that sticks to your shoes and whatever goes into the novel. So it's more like that, I think. And the, 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 the uh, pension thing, uh, I don't know what I thought about it. Um, I was rather staggered to see it, I suppose. Anyway. Doesn't exactly crowd the literary field with mechanical ducks, though, does it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not crowded. Yes, sir. Your reluctance to read from your own work made me think that uh, perhaps you're reluctant to read other writers like Balzac or Henry Lawson. Are you a keen reader of fiction or do you draw inspiration from National Geographic or uh, Stephen Hawking's... Uh, I, think I think reading's a bad thing and it can only damage you. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I advise you all to stay away from it, really. It's pretty... <laughs> Best thing, Henry Lawson on, on rare occasions. <clears throat> Are you really not much of a reader? No, I read all the time. Yeah. <laughs> what are you reading now? What am I reading now? I'm reading uh, Paula Fox, Dangerous Lives. Is it called Dangerous something? Uh, I, you know, I, may, I normally read back to front, so when I get to the end of the book, I read the title. <laughs> You'll be in touch. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question about Parrot and Olivier. It's been suggested by some critics that uh, Parrot was modeled after John James Audubon. I'm just wondering if you comment on that, and particularly the house on the Upper Hudson. And I know that uh, Audubon had a house there. Um, anything? Well, when, when, I began, when I began to develop the character of Parrot, I thought he was the one that was going to end up being an engraver and an artist. But he, his life doesn't go that way, so it's, it's the engraver who's there at the beginning who goes on to do, who has the ambition to, to, to do a book of engravings, I think, from memory, and I can't, of English birds. Well, it was, in one draft it was that anyway. So he's, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the, there, is, there are certain... Uh, there are certain passages where I, I glommed on to stuff from Audubon, you know, from books and, and researching you know, his whole method of putting the portfolios together and subscribing to them and so on. And even, even I do believe that his, his, his wife was, was a, a pretty good shot and used to shoot the birds. So yes, I'll, I've been snooping around, stealing a bit here and stealing a bit there, um, but I wasn't really, I, would, I suppose that, that's sort of a way that sort of it's sort of like going to, for um, well, they things to quite, reinforce yeah. my imagining of something different. They weren't quite contemporaries, although roughly the same time. Um, just wondering about the house on the Hudson. Too. Oh, that was totally made up. Um, completely made up. Thank you. <laughs> Do you show your book to people as you're writing them? At what point do you let them go for for People will get very suspicious of you, you know. Yeah? Oh. You try sidling up to people, giving them... <laughs> man. People you see, know. See, see how yeah. you get on. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, my wife, Frances Cody, uh, reads my work uh, often as I'm, I'm writing it. She's one of the world's great editors and right. publishers. And, right. uh, and she's very... She's a, she's a very good cat wrangler, if, if you know what I mean. Yes. Right, so, yes, yes. So she's not sort of saying there's nothing prescriptive about what she does. Yeah. And so but she, might, she might just ask me a question. Right. At a certain stage. You know, at the end, she'll say, well, what do you really want? The truth? 
I said, all right. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> and that comes at the end? <laughs> well, there's all sorts of helpful things. Right. You know, it's just a sensation. We say, what do you need? I say, well, I really need the strength to keep going. Yeah. Or I really need to know how you see what I've imagined. Or right. I really, does this make sense to you? Or, or something like that. Yeah. But in the end, because, you know, uh, somebody, the, the manuscript will come back covered with little yellow post-its. Sure. With a question here and a note there and a note there. And that's, when, I, when, I, when I was much younger, I couldn't bear anybody to suggest anything about anything. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I do remember to talking about Bliss, that Bliss was published by Faber and Faber, and um, very few changes were made to the manuscript. And a few years later, I was talking to Robert McCrum, who was my editor then, and I said, isn't that funny, you know, because, you know, with Bliss, you know, I just rewrote that paragraph when we all had hangovers, and, 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 and that was it. And, and now I'm changing all these things. And he said, Peter, when your manuscript for Bliss arrived, and this was back before computers. You'd had it professionally typed. It was bound and glued. <laughs> and it had don't fuck with this written all over it. And so, they, and they were right. You know, I mean, I really, I, I, I would have been impossible. I, I was an idiot. But you get a little bit older and you realize that actually talking to somebody intelligent who can read can only help you. Yes. And that you're in charge no matter what. So sure. it's great. Sure, sure. And especially it's someone who's, who, who, who has an understanding of, of what you're trying to do. Like in the sense that, I mean, there are risks taken in all of your books, and there are risks taken in this book as well. I would say that, for example, you know, both Catherine and Henry are, are characters who are constantly challenging our ability to like them and to sympathize with some, them. Some people with small hearts have felt that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and a poor ability to ask questions. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, I was struck by your comment uh, when you said Sorry. that we are still living the consequences of the 19th century. Uh, I think it was uh, Marshall McLuhan who wrote that the major concern of the 19th century was progressivism, and the 20th uh, <laughs> was about uh, primitivism. I could only surmise that it was probably referring to Freud, Jung, mm. and maybe the anthropologists. Mm. Mm. Uh, are, do you see that we might be having some sort of dialectic now that we are firmly in the 21st? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea at all. I'm sorry. And, I, and, I, and you make me realize that, in, that, I, that I said something that's, sort of, that's a sort of a fast illustrative thing about my interest in the 19th century, but it's not, probably not something that's sort of worth being closely examined because, as you've just pointed out, it doesn't stand up. Thank, Thank you. you. Very short question, very basic, but it does interest me how you choose your titles because several of your books are the names of major characters. Mm. And I was thinking, but this, you know, then people have to remember what was that Jack Mags, Jack Megs, what, yeah. etc. And I was thinking, uh, he could do better with his titles. The books are perfect. <laughs> But then I, I started to think of another writer I like, uh, Othello, Macbeth, Hamlet. Yeah, you know. he, he could have How done better How do you choose too. your titles? Yeah. So, uh, are you a title broker? Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, oh, I think you. I think you're right. I, and I always, the thing. I, but it's. I think the chemistry of te tears is probably the only title I, I, I've had that I really like. But I'll probably think it's cheap and awful tomorrow. Um, but I, I do remember trying to get a title for Oscar and Lucinda when I'd finished it. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had a, you know, the manila folders that you, right. you know, and little notes, all these different titles, hundreds of titles, uh, all embarrassing. <laughs> and, uh, and I got there and, and, and I was talking to Robert McCrum and he read it and seemed to like it. And I said, well, I don't know what to call it. And he said, well, what do you want it to be about? And I said, I, really, I suppose I want it to be about the relationship between the two characters. And he said, well, why don't you just call it Oscar and Lucinda? And I said, isn't that boring? <laughs> and he said, don't worry about it. It's fine. And it's probably not a bad way to right. think about titles. I, uh, it's an awful process. One's always, and I think when writing, trying to reassure oneself by getting a good title that somehow or other will freshen up the whole process because you'll redefine what it is that you're doing and you'll mm -hmm. define 
the search and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and anyway, from the questioner, I agree with you totally. I think I could do a lot better. <laughs> it was. I mean, I, I was looking, I did think, you know, what is it that about tears and, and, and the, uh, look, what is the chemistry of tears? What, what, what indeed the tears do apart from lubricating our eyes? And uh, this is where we worked on a sort of a hunch that the body is always full of the most amazing tricks. And indeed, it is full of the most mm -hmm. amazing tricks. And so the, 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 what the tears are doing, uh, so I get to this point of saying this, and I can't remember the third thing, but the, there are three things that the tears mm -hmm. do. Well, you know, one, one is it has an anal they have an analgesic effect. Yes. The other thing is they give you a sort of slight feeling, which is like you, like you get when you've had sex. And the third thing is something else. But in other words, anyway, the, this is a... Chemistry is different according to what yeah. has created tears. Mm -hmm. There you go. The amazing factory of the human body. I mean, yes. Um, if, if we have no other questions this evening, um, then I, what I will do is I would like to take this moment to thank Peter Carey for joining us here at Luminato in Toronto, uh, discussing his new book, The Chemistry of Tears, and to extend a hearty invitation for you to come back at any time um, so that we can continue the conversation. I promise I'll have some better questions for you. Your questions were great. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks very much.